in Hebrew, those of you who know Hebrew, well, you know the word for electricity is uh, chashmal. You know that? Those that you know, chashmal is the word for Hebrew. You heard electricity in Hebrew. Where does it come from? Where does the word chashmal come from? Um, does anyone here that did not go to Hebrew school know where the word chashmal comes from? Okay. Um, so the word chashmal comes from a verse in the book of Ezekiel, Yecheskel, um, where he is describing a vision, the vision of Ezekiel it's called. And this vision, Ezekiel in very cryptic terms, describes different things that he sees. It's essentially a mystical vision. And among the things that he describes is the following verse. He says, V'achayas rotze v'shuv. And in that same verse, he uses the word chashmal. What does a chayis rotze v'shuv mean in uh, simple English? Chayis is um, life. Chayis is energy. And rotze v'shuv means that he sees that this energy is running to and fro. Rotze means to run, and shuv means to return. Which, to put a more contemporary language, you'd say it's a form of tension and resolution, which really is the essence of what life is all about. As I said before, the heartbeat, the, bur- the breath, is all about this type of two dual process, exhale, inhale. But it's not just a physical thing. If you think about it also psychologically and emotionally, what really makes a human being tick? What, of course, each of us are unique. But one universal element, the common denominator that we all have is that life is about a, some form of tension and resolution. When you aspire, for some, aspire to something, you reach for something, that's a form of an angst that's, that creates some tension. Necess, necessary for life. If you do not have any tension, you basically be inan, inanimate and satisfied with animal bliss. As I always mention, you go... I remember the first time I saw it, but you travel a little out of the city, and you see, uh, called behemoths, you see animals grazing in the pastures and the meadows, and if you're in a particularly depressing mo- depressed mode, mood or, uh, or saddened by something, it's, it's, it can be very, you can be very envious of these animals grazing. They don't seem to have any problems. They don't need therapy. They can spend hours just uh, munching on grass in the fields. They breed, they sleep, and they wake up again, and they start the day again. Protecting their young. You know, very, very, life is very simple. So when life gets very complicated, many of us aspire, sometimes want to have, that's also, I guess, a form of tension, just to want to have that animal bliss. But the fact of the matter is, how many of you really would be happy uh, uh, munching in a meadow uh, all day and all along? For animals, it works. They're not uh, human beings, whatever it is, and I'll describe in a moment the way the mystics see it. We do have a measure of tension. Obviously, when tension gets out of control, and it's out of balance, then what happens is tension turns into anxiety, and anxiety turns into depression, and it turns into forces that can even paralyze any movement. But then there's a second side that is necessary in life, and that's called resolution. So if you aspire to something, and then you do things to be able to achieve that aspiration, you want to fulfill your dream, whatever that dream may be. It could be in business, it can be in personal life, It can be in intelligence, in knowledge. It can be through travel. It can be through romance. I mean, you name it. It's the growth of a human being. It's like climbing a ladder. So you can't climb 10 steps at a time, 10 rungs at a time. You climb one, two. You look upward and you see something and you reach reach for it. That reach is a form of tension. Because until you really get it, you don't really fully feel at at peace. Once Once you achieve what you have aspired, so that, in a sense, creates an integration, a, a resolution. And then, as it is with human nature, we aspire for more. And they tell the famous, uh, well, they tell a story, and it's not so famous. Um, one of the Hasidic Rebbes, he called it Tzemach Tzedek. And when he was a young child, he was playing with other children in the field. In the field. And um, there was a ladder there. They were playing on a ladder. And the children were climbing a little up on the ladder, down the ladder, you know, children. Um, but all the children were afraid to climb to the top of the ladder. The only one that climbed to the top was this young boy, this young child who later would become a great giant, spiritual giant in his own right. His grandfather, known as the Balatanya, a very 
made massive scholar and mystic and so on, a revolutionary, this is around the 18th century, um, was watching. And afterwards, he asked his grandson, his little grandson, why is it that all the other children were afraid to climb to the top of the ladder and you were not, you had the courage to go all the way to the top? So he said, simple Zayd, grandpa. He said, when all the other children climbed, they kept looking down. So they saw how high they were. They were afraid to climb higher. When I was climbing, I kept looking up. So I saw how low I was, and it motivated me to climb higher. Now you can imagine that's why he became who he became. Now we all have these two options all the time. You'll see when you are uh, socializing or hanging out with people that are less accomplished than you, you'll always stagnate as a result. Because you say, look how much I've done compared to these losers, so to speak. Let's not use that word, to these uh, less accomplished individuals. And it makes you feel good. And usually that type of uh, self-satisfaction is usually not a great motivator. But when you're around people, you hang around people that are much comp more accomplished than you, if you have the courage to do that, then what it does is it motivates you. You start saying, hey, look at what I've done, relatively speaking. So we can have that. We have that choice. Do you look down or do you look up? Um, a healthy person should be looking up most of the time. You look up and you see what you have not yet reached. Not just to make yourself feel uh, anxious or ang angst, but in order to motivate you, to, uh, to uh, prompt you to move there, to move upward. The key is not to move too fast or not to have too much angst. And that's why this verse, going back, is so vital. What it means is that energy, all forms of energy require rotsay, a form of tension, reaching, aspiring, reaching to something beyond that you have right now. And second is resolution, shuv, return, which means integrating it, breathing it back in, like fresh air. So you exhale, and then you inhale a new, uh, a new breath. And the same thing with the heart, and the same thing with all forms of energy. And this is why chashmal, electricity, you see the, mo the symbol of electricity, you'll always see is like a lightning bolt which is usually for some reason drawn like a, zig like a Z, like a zigzag. Because lightning, when you see it, seems exactly, when you look at lightning in the heavens, when lightning strikes, what you see is it's like runs and returns. It's like a bolt. That's what it is. You call it almost like a running, uh, a running, uh, uh, a running uh, current. So when we imagine, even though electricity is invisible, but when we imagine electricity, like we see lightning, it's something that's never stands in one place. It's constantly in the type of movement. And basically it's what's called the dual movement of positive and negative, which, we can, which you can demonstrate with any magnet, and that electromagnetism of two forces that create tension. And that tension results in energy, in the flow of energy. Without the tension, there's no energy. You get two positives or two negatives, they, they, neutralize, they are neutral, and there's no, nothing will grow from it. So all growth is a, pro is a process of attention and a resolution. I even once created a chart, which was, I think, too complicated actually to use, but I just have to get revisit it. I created a chart of the Swatsi and Vishuvi in our own lives. You can diagnose yourself, guaranteed. Either you have too much angst or you have too much resolution. You're too much, too much bliss and too comfortable with yourself or there's too much anxiety. That's the imbalance of life, and that was, that's what creates... Uh, disturbs health and it disturbs the flow so we need both but the challenge is not just to have both the challenge is to make sure they're in the right measure where they uh, where they where they create a healthy type of movement and healthy uh, healthy uh, energy so this is not just as an introduction this is also the theme of this evening which I chose because this week some of you may be familiar if you're familiar with the concept of the Torah chapters so in Jewish tradition, in Jewish life, um, much of uh, the time is regulated and uh, the, in a way measured by the different chapters you read in the Torah. You go to any synagogue on a particular week, and they take out a Torah scroll on a Shabbos and also Mondays and Thursdays, and they read from a particular chapter. So there are 52 chapters in what we call the Bible, the Torah. Um, and these 52 chapters, each of them, breaks into seven sections. In effect, you have 
a chapter that corresponds to every week in the year and one that corresponds to every day in the week. Seven sections of 52 chapters. So, in fact, we really have for every, sec every day, you really have a corresponding part of the Torah. And one of the great challenges that I've always discussed, and one maybe this may be the underlying, I guess, mission of this coming together here, is how can we find relevance in a particular chapter when many of them seem to be discussing about archaic ideas that are uh, that a different part of the geography, different time in history. So yes, there are universal messages in the Bible that remain that compel remain compelling and capture the imagination of thinkers and poets till this day. Principles of the Torah. But there are many, many chapters that when you read it, you don't, you don't necessarily see relevance. And one of them that I'm going to address this evening is a special chapter that's not read usually. In this week's, as we go from Purim to Passover in the Jewish calendar, so there are four special chapters that are read in addition to the regular cycle, which means on the regular cycle this week is the end of the book of Exodus the second book of the five books, which, by the way, is the reason the word Chumash. If you ever hear the word Chumash, Chumash means fifth. So it means five. That's why it's called Chumash, because it's five books. And um, we're finishing, the, concluding the second book is called the book of Exodus, or the book of Shemais. And specifically, it discusses the construction of the sanctuary, the holy sanctuary, which would later become the temple in Jerusalem. At this point, it's still a portable sanctuary that, was, that the Jews traveled with through the wilderness. But in addition, at the end of, uh, when they take out the Torah scrolls of Shabbos, they'll take out a second scroll. Because this Shabbos, they also bless, we also bless the new month. Which month is this? The month of Nisan, which is a unique month, as I'll explain. It's the month of Passover. So this Shabbos, every, this month, the, the Shabbos that precedes the new moon, of a month, it's called Shabbos Mavarchim. It's a special blessing is said during the Musaf prayer, during the extra prayer on Shabbat, which is, blesses the new month, that it should be a month of joy and a month of success and a month of health, and materially and spiritually and all levels. And uh, so this one, this month is being blessed. A particular Torah, a second Torah scroll is taken out of the Ark, and they read in it, the chapter that is called in one word, Parshas HaChedesh. HaChedesh, which means, literally means renewal, or the month. And it refers to the chapter in, a, in another, in a, it refers to a chapter in another portion of the Torah that discusses, or when God is t finally tells Moses that HaChedesh HaZelachem, this is the new month when your people will be, when you will redeem the people, and I believe, Egypt. So this chapter has a very particular significance. It really sets in motion the whole entire exodus that we are familiar with. And that chapter is read this week. So all this that I've just said is quite technical. And I hope I didn't bore anybody with the technicalities or remind some people here of their good days in yeshiva and in Hebrew school and how insignificant or irrelevant was all these texts. Um, because the bottom line is that, as, as many of you may know, or if you don't, you'll, know, you'll hear now, that the, there's the two parts of the Torah. There's the, the technical, mechanical, robotic part, and then there's the soul. And frankly, without the soul part, without the soul dimension, the rest of it is usually rendered quite uh, empty. So yes, there may be Jewish communities that abide by these laws robotically without thinking. And not only there may be, there actually are. I've seen a few in my time, and, but the bottom line is that's really missing the boat in a way because the real dimension is the soul of it, which is the relevance. So, of course, the big question is, why, how is this relevant to us, what God told Moses 3,000, over 3,300 years ago when, uh, when, the, when the Jewish people left Egypt? And specifically, this word, hachedish, this, this is the new month. Because the way we have to look at it is this. It doesn't, not only that it should be relevant, but it should be indispensable. Frankly, we're all busy people. What we're busy with is another story, but everybody's busy with one thing or another. And when you want to talk about something, and we're all spending a few uh, moments together here this evening, I hope it's more than a few moments, let's call it an hour or so, um, 
or two or three or whatever. Um, we hope that, this, the, that our time together should not be wasted and that what we discuss here is actually helpful to us in our lives. I would not have the chutzpah to sit here and pontificate if I didn't think that what I have to say has relevance. Now, what I'm going to share is not necessarily my own wisdom. It's what I've learned. And I consider it to be maybe the best kept secret in a way because it carries mystical and spiritual and more above all psychological and emotional truths that can help us all uncover a dimension inside of ourselves that we may not be familiar with. Or we may be, but it's hard to access. So it's called being resonate, resonance. So for me, the challenge has always been, when we talk about any, any topic for that matter, but especially a Torah topic, it has to have profound relevance to our personal lives. The things we're struggling with, the things that we carry inside of our intimate psyches that maybe we share or we don't share with anyone else. For that matter, we may not even share it with ourselves. And that's ultimately the litmus test of a truth, a truth that resonates, and not just resonates as a, a nice idea, but one that is empowering and can provide us with some life skills that can help us deal with these challenges that we all struggle with. So I don't profess to know everyone's personal challenges. Everyone has their lives. But the human condition is such that many things are, we can understand each other because we share certain things. You know, there's no one here that has not cried in their lifetime. And there's probably no one here that hasn't laughed in their lifetime. So when you talk about the basic fundamentals of human life, most of us, when we feel pain, we can empathize with someone else because pain has similar reactions. It doesn't mean you can empathize with every type of pain. There are obviously pains in life that are very are almost impossible to even, uh, undescribable how horrible they are. And if you have not been there, it's very difficult to talk. But nevertheless, there is, we're blessed in some way. Maybe it is because, as the mystics say, there's an integral unity that connects us all, whether we feel, or, feel it or not, or whether we like it or not. So maybe if a person is able to suspend their ego a bit, they can actually feel another person. And the reason we don't is because we're self-contained and we're self-consumed with self-interest. You know, there's a story they tell about um, another great Rebbe. To me, it's one of my favorites because it's like, you talk about understanding the classic, um, what is a true, a true rabbi? Not an administrator, not a fundraiser, not what any rabbi you've ever met. It's a true soul doctor. A person who is an expert on souls. So just like a doctor can give you an x-ray of your body, a true rabbi or rebbe is someone that can give you an x-ray of your soul. So they tell the story of this great rebbe who, in Russia as well, who um, would, as the custom was, people would come to consult with him about personal matters or get a blessing. And this was a particular time where they met, where people were lined up after the holiday season, the high holiday season, so before they were going back home, after the holidays, they came to the Rebbe to get a blessing or to discuss or consult with some matter that was uh, concerned them. And uh, there was a line was long. Many people wanted to meet this great Rebbe. His wisdom, his sensitivity, his spirituality was renowned. Anyway, things were progressing nicely, moving along, and the assistants that were helping uh, facilitate were all very um, glad that, you know, that people were getting their time, and then everything was going well. Suddenly, after one, after, the, after one person finished his audience and left the room, the Rebbe tells the secretary, tells his assistant, he, needs to, he wants to take a break, which was really unlike him. He usually never took a break, but uh, this is, the Rebbe wants to take a break. Maybe he's tired. Maybe he has something else he has to do, whatever. So he thought it will be a break for 10 minutes, 15 minutes, half an hour. So he told the people, there's going to be a short break, and, and come back or wait, your turn. Anyway, it wasn't a half hour, it wasn't an hour, it was hours and hours and hours. It got late into the night, and uh, finally, the assistant told everybody, it seems that this is not going to be short, you know, maybe you should go home to go to sleep and come back in the morning. Many people had, were waiting to travel, but uh, if they wanted to wait, they, they, you know, they, that was their, that, they had no choice. And as I said, it was unlike the Rebbe to do something like that. He knew people were waiting. What the secretary assistant did here through the door was that he heard the Rebbe sobbing, weeping. So clearly, he was going through something very difficult. It wasn't just resting. Anyway, after a day, day and a half, the Rebbe resumed the audience as if nothing happened. 
and uh, till the whole thing finished, and remained an oddity. A while later, the sister had an opportunity to ask the Rebbe and said to him, you know, Rebbe, I know that I don't want to intrude in the Rebbe's personal work, but the Rebbe always encourages us to ask questions. I was wondering if the Rebbe was willing to share what happened. That usually the, the Rebbe would suddenly stop and have people wait a day, day and a half. And the Rebbe said, I'll tell you. What happened was the following. When people come see me and they share their life with me in one way or another, or they share something that they're going through, and they ask for advice, the first thing I need to do is find a parallel inside my own soul of a similar issue or challenge that that person has. It may not be quite the same extent. It may be bedakas, bedakas, as they say in Hebrew, be subtle. But nevertheless, I have to find something that I can identify with. Because I'm not just here to talk and give ideas and advice. And when I hear from somebody, why did God send that person to me? Because I have to hear what that person has to say, just as that person has to hear what I have to say. So I have to find in my own soul, in my own heart, in my own in, inner consciousness, something that's similar. And then I can repair it, and then I could advise that person to do the same in their, on their level. There was this person who came to see me, and they shared something with me that was so horrendous, so impossible for me to fathom, I couldn't find anywhere inside my own soul anything similar. Not even in the most subtle form. So I had to stop because I could not give advice. And I had to find it somewhere inside of me. And I was basically praying and soul searching with a deep introspection to try to find that flaw or that, that um, inconsistency within myself. And once I did, I was able to give the advice to that person and then resumed. Now, it's very rare that you hear the inner workings of a true Rebbe. They usually don't share. They say in this uh, world, I always say this when people ask me about Kabbalah, that those that know don't say, and those that say don't know. That's how it usually is with the deepest secrets. Yeah, people who are saying, especially if they're taking money for it, I don't know how much you can trust. Um, so, but those that truly know, and I've met a mystic or two in my life, they don't uh, make a big fuss about it, and it's not something you can just um, elicit from them. You'll, know what, you'll hear what you have to hear. And if you don't have to hear the mysteries of your soul, and what reincarnation you came from, and what your destiny holds, you will not hear it. Unless it's necessary for you to know, and unless you also will responsibly do something with it, and not just uh, like the, 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 everyone loves the unknown, the, the curi to satisfy the curiosity of, uh, of, of uh, the exotic. So when we talk about these truths, to me, uh, to be able to discuss all these matters, it's critical that we all go deeper into our own souls and hearts, and for that, we really have to uh, somewhat suspend sometimes our preconceptions and definitely our egos. And so I'm not asking, I'm not making any conditions here. You can do what you wish. But I will just say that truth in general, wherever you go and wherever you'll be, is in direct proportion that it will enter into your system, direct proportion to how much you allow it to enter. As the Kutzka Rebbe was once asked when he was a little child, when they asked him, where is God? So he said, wherever you let him in. In other words, if you were to define reality as reality, where is reality? The answer is where you let it in. There are many people um, who live very unreal lives, deceptive lives, lives, duplicitous lives. Is there no reality in them? There's reality. They just don't let it in. Or let's put it this way. It remains locked inside of them. They don't let it out. That may be a better way to put it. So within us all, there is... A, a sense, an instinct of truth. And uh, when we live in an untruthful world, which the world that we live in, a cruel world, we increasingly become more callous and cynical in a way because we see everybody else around us, people we cannot trust. So we too, so-called, um, withdraw and hide behind our own shells and our own defense mechanisms. Just like a turtle uh, will, will, will withdraw when thinking he's going to be attacked, or she, into a hard shell. Every one of us has a shell. Some of us harder than others. There's complex defense mechanisms we develop as we go through life. And especially if we've been hurt in our childhoods, we definitely develop these, these armors. And, uh, and usually, that's what most people see when they meet you, because you don't let down your guard so fast. And for good reason. Who can you trust? So trust has to be earned. 
But at the same time, we can also get trapped in our own protection. Where you so much, uh, uh, you're so, uh, you're so uh, uh, blocked by your own armor that when real truth comes your way, you don't even let it in. And you don't even know. And it's a difficult one because how can you decide and choose? So there's a method and there's a process. I discussed it a little last week. It's not so much the theme of this evening, but I just, since I'm touching upon it, I want to just say one thing about it. We were blessed with mind. The mind. And a mind is an interesting um, commodity. It's an interesting, uh, it's interesting power. A mind doesn't make decisions. A mind at its best is like a good processor, a good computer that processes information, can watch things, can observe, can study, can apply different wisdom and different experiences, and then can tell you, this is what I have observed. But then comes the moment of decision is always going to be an emotional one. The mind can lead you to the door, but should you marry this person? Should you choose this route? Should you travel here or travel there? Is always going to be an emotional decision. Hopefully, it's informed by an intelligent process of research. That way, you don't make the mistakes that one can make if you just follow your emotions. So being someone that can use their minds, it's in a way, what a mind really is, it's almost like an explorer that looks around and sees like a scout, can I trust this environment? So when you meet someone for the first time, what should be happening, I'm talking in a healthy situation, is your mind is exploring through questions, through probing, through observing. You test. People test each other. Maybe that's not a good word. No one likes to use it. But I'll call test and calling observation. Observant Jew. You're observing and watching and so on. And as, as, you, as your mind tells you different things, different results, um, in a healthy situation, slowly your heart will emerge. You'll allow your emotions to interact. But until that point of that trust is achieved, most of us will not allow our hearts to interact. There's also the other extreme where you let your heart out too quickly, for whatever reason it is, and you trust too quickly and usually get disappointed and hurt. So there's a process. But the point that I was making here was that when you're addressing any topic around the Torah and so on, at least where I come from, if it doesn't have that profound relevance that touches and resonates in that inner place of reality or truth that each of us carries, to me it's been a waste of the evening. So that's my objective here, to take this, uh, this theme of this week's portion, which I said is renewal, and apply it to our lives. So let's talk about this thing called renewal. When you see newborn children playing around, and I'm just blessed to have a grand, new grandchild, already four months old, and uh, living in California, so I'm observing it firsthand. But every one of us, and I'm sure everybody here, has seen children. And there's something very uh, attractive and something very um, uh, contagious even. A child never rests because they've entered a new world, a new world, and they're exploring all the time. And they're taken by the enchantment of life. And sometimes when you observe it, if you think about it, you'd love to be in a place like that. And sometimes you wonder, as um, I at least wonder, does the child know what kind of difficult world he or she has entered? And what will happen when the child will begin to so-called become aware that life is not as exciting and as um, enchanting and magical as, the, as a newborn child or the first months or first years a child experience? So where, where, where is that point that we become jaded, basically? What's the point where we've turned, when we, we call it, a lose our, we lost our innocence? Anybody here know, remembers the moment you lost your innocence? You don't have to expose exactly how that happened. But uh, does anybody really remember? I've thought about it many times. I can't really identify my own uh, moment of losing paradise, so to speak, or losing lo a loss of innocence. But I will say, it probably the reason that we can't remember the moment is because once you cross over, it's like a new world. And, it doesn't, and, and it's like two different type of personalities. So we, what do we really remember when we were really young children? We don't remember much. I mean, we have these fleeting memories here and there. Um, as adults, we suddenly come to the term that we call maturity. So what's maturity? Maturity is don't be so innocent, don't be so naive. This world is not such a simple world. You know, like people, or, or I, I, I can't tell you how many times I hear this every day. You know, Rabbi, you're very optimistic, we like you and all that, but you haven't seen the harshest part of this life, this world. And there's darkness you have not seen. Um, 
and um, and I know what they're trying to say. And I tell them, well, you know something, maybe you haven't seen light that I have seen. So we're both in the same boat. I'll introduce you to my perspective, you introduce me to yours, and we'll see who will prevail. You know, because as it says in the Bible right in the beginning of Genesis, it says that, that light and darkness were all intermingled like one big snowball effect. There's no such thing as something that's completely light, and there's no such thing as something that's completely dark. It doesn't work that way. Everything, had, there are glimmers of life, light, even in the darkest places, and the opposite is also true. And uh, what's difficult in life is that it gets all confused, and you can't make heads or tails, you can't distinguish between the two. So, the question of feeling uh, rejuvenation, renewal, in a world where we sometimes feel very old and worn down and uh, broken even, um, is not a simple challenge. Yes, I'm sure everybody can find moments, especially if you drink enough, and a few other uh, so-called using other uh, what, external substances, foreign substances, that you can get yourself into some type of uh, high. Um, whether it's healthy or not is another story. And uh, that can last for a little while. And people do that to relieve the pain, to relieve the tension, as I mentioned, tension, to relieve the, the monotony. People will do anything when there's that type of state. People are desperate. When you're, de when you're desperate, you'll do all kinds of things, whether it's healthy or not. That's part of the sign that, to me, that's a sign of health, that a person is alive. You know, whenever um, I just gave a talk a little while ago, uh, a few weeks ago, to a group of, of practitioners who deal with re drug rehab and drug and alcohol rehabilitation and stuff like that. And they wanted to hear a perspective from so-called um, mystical perspective. I guess mystical, mystical slash psychological. And I shared with them, I said, uh, from a mystical perspective, uh, every human being has a lot of energy inside of them. And how do you know when a person has a lot of energy? You see them acting out one way or another. So if it's, they can act out in a very healthy way and build things, but they can also act out in a very destructive way and destroy things. So when you see a young, uh, a young teen uh, or any person who is an uh, extremely addictive type of personality, you know, they easily are drawn to anything that is addictive. And what, what, what does it tell you about that person? So I asked the question to the professionals. So they said it tells you they probably have an unhealthy life. And, they, and they're desperate, and they need something to relieve themselves with. So they go to drugs, or to alcohol, or to sex, or to gambling, whatever it is that is the particular addiction. And uh, I said to them, well, the mystic would say that that's true, but there's one step deeper. Why do some resort to these addictions and others don't? In the same circumstance, both of them have suffered. Take two children from a dysfunctional homes, or two children who have suffered some trauma, and some will go toward and it become more addictive than others. Why is that? They said, well, that we don't really know. I'll say, well, I'll tell you what I can share with you is the reason is because addiction is a sign of very profound energy that wants to be released and doesn't know how to be released. So it's not just relieving a pain and trying to medicate yourself or numb yourself to the pains of life, which is definitely a legitimate element. There's another thing is a lot of energy the person has, and if it doesn't, it's not channeled in a healthy way, they're looking for, they need to have a high. Some people who are more mediocre don't, perhaps don't need to have that type of high. And there's actually a Talmudic statement that says, The greater the person, the greater the Yetzirah. The greater the person, the greater the evil inclination. The greater passion they will have to unhealthy things. So how do you explain that? The answer is because it's all about energy. So even if energy is being misdirected, it's still energy. The challenge is how do you uh, dissect the two? How do you split the energy from its unhealthy objective? How unhealthy object. So to just use an example, um, I remember once in this class someone asked me the question. They said, you know, what you teach is very interesting and nice stuff, but look, frankly, it doesn't seem very sexy to become a tzaddik. You know, someone who doesn't have any temptations and has no uh, fun and doesn't sin once in a while. And like, you know, you need to have the, the taste of the forbidden fruit. They say, The stolen waters are always sweeter. 
And uh, it doesn't sound like, you know, this type of aspiring to become a tzaddik doesn't sound like really a very uh, exciting thing. You know, it sounds like you come to a point where you're so holy and, 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 uh, and uh, pure that uh, nothing uh, disturbs you. Who wants to live a life like that? So what would you say? That's an interesting question, right? I never put, I thought of it that way. I, I, I may, first said to everybody here, well, first of all, you're not talking to a tzaddik, so you got the wrong guy. You have to talk to a real tzaddik, and maybe they have something to say. But I shared with them what I thought was this. I said, you're misunderstanding what a tzaddik is. And it's not a tzaddik like, you know, like Grandma Rose said, oh, you're such a tzaddik, you brought me a, a pillow, you know. That's not what we're talking about. Um, uh, a tzaddik goes like this. When you see a little child, for instance, play with toys, and they're passionately involved in their, their game, and they're all excited about it, completely consumed. Then take someone a little ten, 10 years older, and they're sitting at a computer, and they're busy in the same type of passion with uh, some uh, with Twitter or whatever it is, some uh, new uh, gadget. And people do this, I mean, you, you know how many hours a day? And then take someone 10 years later, uh, well, they may be doing the same thing, but let's just, for argument, just to make this uh, experiment a little broad, they're reading a book, a book, whatever the book is. And they're reading it also completely immersed and engrossed. And then there's another person who's going out as a volunteer and helping other people, and they're passionate about it and completely excited about it. And then you have a tzaddik who uh, dwells in the spiritual realms, a spiritual person, who gets completely passionate and excited about the spiritual, about the sublime, and not the material. So tell me, is there, what's the difference between the child, the teenager, the one reading the book, the one ma making money and is very passionate about it, the one eating a candy and is, loves it, and the tzaddik? What's the difference? The difference is only one thing. They all have energy, they all have passion. The difference is the object of the desire. A tzaddik too has great temptations and desires. And that can equal probably the temptations and desires even of the sinful person. The difference is one has matured to a point that the object of desire is not a little toy. Most of you would not want it right now interested in getting down on your knees and, 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 and the floor playing with a little toy or games. Or maybe you would. Maybe the MLC at 6 can provide that too. We can create a little playground if, if, if people need that. But you know what I mean. In other words, as a person develops their interests, the passion doesn't change. What you're simply changing is the intelligence and what you consider to be a desirable thing. So when you're teaching someone, and which is a big mistake, people think that the purpose of what's called discipline, of your disciplining your Yetzirah, so to speak, disciplining your evil inclination or your temptations, is to, is to weaken them, is to uh, keep them at bay, to control them. Mind over matter. Mayok Shalat Alalev, the heart, the mind controls the heart. Or as uh, Lawrence Taylor said, when they asked him, how does he play? You all know Lawrence Taylor? Not a mystic, but uh, uh, the famous uh, Giants linebacker. Okay, so he used to play even when he was quite uh, injured. And they asked him, how do you have the ability to play with such injuries? So he said, it's mind over matter, simple. When you don't mind, it doesn't matter. That's the way he put it. So that's another form of mind over matter. So um, the difference between one and the next, and I'm sorry, the mistake that's made is that people think you have to cut out temptation, a lobotomy. Somebody has unhealthy temptations, unhealthy desires, lusts. The way to do it is either through guilt or uh, through other methods uh, utilized, let's say, in films like Clockwork Orange or something like that, and so on, that you try to cut out that part of the person. And the Torah approach, the ultimate Torah approach, which is not so well known, even in the yeshiva systems, or maybe specifically there, is that there's another approach, which is temptation has two sides to it, the object of the desire and the desire itself. The power of desire is the healthiest force in the human being. Because what desire can bring you is much more powerful than anything else. Desire and, and passion is a very strong energy. It can change the world. The object of the desire is what you want to teach a person, that it shouldn't be little toys or little games or, or trivial things, but the object should be something that has permanent value or has higher value. But the temptation is not less, and no one should ever think that a tzaddik's temptation or a tzaddik's passions have been weakened in any way. 
It's based on a very distorted view of what spirituality is, which, if I may say so, I think is very much influenced by Christian v view on sin and Christian view on, uh, t and on temptation and on love and on sexuality, for that matter. It's considered a necessary evil. That when Adam and Eve ate from the tree of knowledge, a certain contamination entered into this world. The devil controls the universe and your hearts, unless you give your heart to a certain Jew, which I always found quite uh, intriguing. You know, that's that, And that has affected modern culture and the way we think, and I would even say the Torah yeshiva system as well. The concept of Jewish guilt, for example, that everyone talks about, especially Woody Allen, uh, Jew Jewish guilt, I find it to be an oxymoron. I'd like someone to even find a word of guilt in Hebrew, in the Torah language. There's no such word for guilt. There's words called harata. There's words regret. There's re words of, of uh, chayev. I meant guilt. I meant the feeling of guilt. No, it's a person who's guilty doing something wrong. I, mean, I don't mean guilty in a, in a crime. I meant the feeling that you should be feeling guilty. Generally speaking, as he says in Tanya, any feeling that a human being has that's demoralizing comes from a dark place, from an evil place. So if someone puts a guilt trip on you and says to you, you know, you look, look who you are, look what you've done, and so on, if it demoralizes you and does not motivate you, you can rest assured it's coming from an unhealthy place. If someone, on the other hand, um, even if they rebuke you, but it's with love and it motivates you and it gives you strength to do something about it, then that's another story. So in general, these type of feelings that the events of our lives and the evil in our lives is something that we have to feel guilty about and, uh, and, um, and be demoralized about is really an unhealthy reaction. So what do you do? The ultimate answer is to understand that we have many energies flowing inside our souls. And the choice you're going to have is where you're going to put them. Yes, there may be certain things a person has succumbed to that may be wise and healthy to avoid. You know, as you'll hear from any alcoholic, they'll tell you, I can never drink alcohol ever again. To me, one, drink, one drop is, 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 is like drinking bottles because I'm, I'm, I'm addicted. So if, obviously, if a person in any way has to so-called discipline themselves, I'm not discussing that situation. But overall, the ultimate challenge is how do you channel that energy? How do you channel it into healthy things? So now to go back to this uh, chapter, HaChadosh, okay, and its relevance to our lives. So the technical story, as I mentioned briefly before, and I'll elaborate, is, goes like this. By Yemir Hashem al that's how the chapter begins, and God speaks to Moses. This is outside in the Alexandria, or whatever the capital of Egypt was, and God says to Moses, HaChadosh HaZelachem, he tells him, to look up into heaven, and you'll see the new moon. And this is to you, the new moon, the new month. And then he continues and says, this is how you shall sanctify the new moon every year, again and again. And from here we have the mitzvah, we call the mitzvah of Kiddush HaChadosh, or Kiddush Levan, where once a month, usually in the first quarter, some often Saturday night, if it's not a cloudy night, the people will go out in the street after the services and uh, look up into the sky of, and, at the moon and make a blessing on the moon. It's all based on this verse. Why was this so relevant? So then the chapter continues. That God says, in this month, I shall also renew you and your nation. I will give you the power to ultimately leave Egypt. And in 15 days from this day, I promise you that the Jews will leave Egypt. God forsaken Mitzrayim. Okay, and that's what happens. And then the chapter continues to talk about the, the preparations that the Jewish people should make to leave this uh, land. And we read this chapter, as I said, this coming Shabbos, as we bless the new moon of Nisan. So there's much that can be said about the moon and its renewal. What I'm going to address here, of course, is the whole issue I discussed earlier about life itself. Can we truly find rejuvenation in a life that has worn us down. That's the bottom line. Now, some of us are more worn down than others, and some days we feel more worn down than other days, obviously. So I'm sure there are moments, as I said before, where we can elicit in a healthy way, or maybe not such a healthy way, but even in a healthy way, 
a certain force, feeling of renewal. You know, sometimes you meet a new friend, you read a new book, new experience, a new song. I mean, there's many different things, a new love, and you will experience something renewed. The question is, how long will it last? And is it an accident? Is, can you generate this on your own, or is it something that, you know, that is a, based on grace from heaven? So as we will discuss in, in a few moments, obviously this chapter addresses this in a very direct way, and this is the relevance. Um, the moon is a symbol of renewal because the moon is a constantly waning and waxing entity, as opposed to the sun, which is consistently shining. Yes, the sun also goes through its changes, and there are sun flares and sunspots, and the sun is, as we know, is a body of gases and energy that's constantly in movement, but to the naked eye on Earth, the sun is a consistent um, source of energy, whereas the moon is constantly changing. Both ways, it waxes, it grows, and then it wanes, it diminishes, until the point where it becomes completely in invisible, the angle of the sun um, reflecting on the moon to the earth is completely uh, non-existent. And then, and that just at that moment, there's a thing called a new moon. A new moon is when the glimmer, the glimpse of a new, a new month begins. Now, in truth, you could say, well, the whole thing, if you know some science, is really uh, the moon is always uh, completely reflecting the sun. The only difference is whether, whether we see it on earth. But, the, chat, but the, the message really here is how we see it, how we perceive it. And the fact is when the moon is actually reflecting the sun on earth, there are, it's not just a, uh, a theoretical thing. It has physical impact on this earth. It has impact on the tides. It has impact on certain plants and on certain nocturnal life. In other words, the moon's light is not just a small matter. A full moon actually has an impact in many ways. Besides for those that uh, believe in werewolves, and, uh, and that impact, you know. But uh, the moon has its own uh, mysterious power. As we see, you'll see two people who love each other. You'll never find them staring at the sun, but you can find them staring at the moon, you know. So though the moon, all it is really is a mirror of the sun. It's reflecting the sun. But as you see, it doesn't, have, it doesn't even look like the sun. It has its own gray, silver color. It's its own haunting type of force. And of course, it's at night, which has its own energy. So there's much that's written, literally volumes, about this verse when God tells Moses. Because as Rashi says, HaKedish Hazel Lechem means, the word Hazet, whenever it says in the Torah, Hazet means this, this that you see here. When you say the word Hazet in Hebrew, it means that you're seeing it. You're able to point with your finger to it. So Rashi and the commentary, the Medrash explains, is because God actually pointed and said, look into the sky and here's what it looks like. Because Moses was mystified by the concept of the new moon. He didn't understand what it meant. And everyone asked the question, what didn't he understand? Moses was a quite intelligent man, didn't understand the moon. He, seen, he saw many new moons before this. The moon wasn't created the year the Jews left Egypt. So what was Moses disturbed, uh, mystified by? And what he was mystified by was the same thing that was the reason that God told him. The Jews were 210 years in this dark place called Egypt. That's a long time. The Holocaust, just for proportional reason, for, just for comparison purposes, was 10 years, 5 years. This was 210 years. And I'm not minimizing the Holocaust, don't get me wrong. 210 years is generations. It means people died in this dark place. And the question is, after 210 years that they were in bondage, and broken, and killed, and Pharaoh bathing in the blood of Jewish children, and so on, what, what morale was left? And how is it even possible to uh, leave a place like this? Psychologically, forget about physically. And this was not a small matter for Moses because when Moses first came into Egypt with God's message that you will leave this place, it says the Jews couldn't even hear what he had to say. In one of the most strong, powerful lines that we can all identify with, it says, from the hard labor and from the shortness of breath, they were unable to even hear what Moses had to say. You ever been in a situation like that? Where you're so overwhelmed by life, you can't even hear if someone has a message of hope for you. 
You know, it's not just your ears are blocked. Your whole psyche is is all is all uh, is all what's the word? Um, um, I have a word for it. Like the word that's static. I forgot how it works. Turbulent. No, there's a it's a completely clogged. Maybe okay, fine. You get the idea. And you can't even hear. I <coughs> sadly have seen this many times. People come to consult with me and try to say something you see you can't. You're never going to get through because they're so overwhelmed with the moment that you can't. There's nothing they, that they will hear. I mean, so there are methods. Moses was faced with his dilemma. So when God said to him, "Renewal, a new moon, a new day has emerged, has has arrived, and a new a new era and a new stage," now that Moses was skeptical, he wanted God to really. Guarantee it, and he said, "I don't understand. I can't I t explain to me how, in the darkest of dark, a new a new uh, world can open up." So God said, Kadesh. Here I point to you, and I show it. Look at this, and this is the symbol. If you look at it closely, you will see the how it can be done. Now, what exactly Moses saw remains a mystery till this day, because you can't even see a new moon. That's the whole point. Why it's a new moon? What do you see? But he saw something. Maybe he saw something in the darkness that allowed him to see that the light will come out of it. Maybe he saw the bigger picture. You know, there are people who, um, who've gone through certain difficult situations and you come to them and they can tell you, yes, this is where you are right now, but I can tell you that tomorrow or in a few weeks, this is where you will be because I've been there. There's a certain process of how healing takes place. So as they say, who's the wise person? The one who sees the birthing. When you look at life right now, in this moment, what do you see? You only see what your myopic vision can allow you to see. The wise person is able to see what this moment is giving birth to. Those are people who are able to not be overcome by the moment or by even the pain of the moment and are able to see something being birthed, something growing out of this. And it's those people that survive and see it through. Those of us that cannot allow ourselves to see that often get overwhelmed, and then when the birthing comes, you can't even see it happening. So what this chapter is saying is essentially was the secret of how one achieves renewal in darkest of times. Now, the word Mitzrayim, as I've often explained, and obviously very relevant to this month as we approach Passover, the word Mitzrayim is, this, is the key to the entire story. Mitzrayim in Hebrew is the Hebrew word for Egypt. But it doesn't really mean Egypt. Mitzrayim has a meaning, which really means Mitzrayim Metzar means constraints, limits, narrowness. Basically, the true Mitzrayim, the true psychological Mitzrayim, far more than the physical one, is every inhibition and every fear and insecurity that we have is what Mitzrayim refers to. And there's two options. Either you'll be trapped and enslaved in your inhibitions and fears and insecurities, or you'll find a way to redeem yourself from them. That's the difference between Golas Mitzrayim and Gaulas Mitzrayim. The difference between um, the exile, the, tra the, the bondage, and the, and the Yitzhiyas Mitzrayim, the redemption. This is why the redemption from Egypt is such a central force in uh, Jewish life, in all of life. You know, why is it that we, um, literally in every prayer, we repeat and we remind ourselves, Jews left Egypt, Jews left Egypt. Every year, Passover. What is this obsession that we have to recreate the exodus from Egypt? Okay, it could be cute for the children, and nostalgic, it's, a, uh, it's commemorative, it's a time to get together, etc. But bottom line is, what, what it, it, can, it can also become, as I said, somewhat obsessive, somewhat... Um, uh, it's somewhat almost irrelevant and the answer is that this is not about remembering or recreating something that happened thousands of years ago it's about happening right now why is this, why is this such a big story in the Torah that it takes so, much, uh, so many pages and also becomes a central theme throughout the entire Torah you'll find it's constantly, constantly mentioned Ten Commandments I am your God not, doesn't say the God that created heaven and earth the one that took you out of Egypt. 
Why? Every time you have to be reminded because the secret to all, the challenge of all of life is in one word called transcendence. Can you transcend the limitations of existence? Now philosophers and theologians and all, really all mystical schools of thought, including in the East and the West, all were faced with this challenge. Can the mortal human being, the fickle mortal human being, the finite creature that we are, touch infinity? This has been the challenge in one sentence of every mystic, every poet, every writer, everyone who's always tried to wonder how, how kind of human, where, where can we reach? How far can we reach? And there, of course, there are those that dismiss the whole concept and say it's, it's a human folly to even dream of these things. But there are millions and billions that continue to aspire. Michelangelo, in his famous painting of Adam reaching to God, captured in that, what I mentioned before, that tension, where the finger of Adam is like trembling. You could almost see it come alive. And it's just about to touch the finger of God, but they don't touch. That little space where the human tries to touch the divine, where, he, where earth tries to touch heaven, has been the aspiration in some way or another of human beings. Some call it the search for immortality. Others call it, uh, Jimi Hendrix calls it kissing the sky. Everyone had their way of expressing it. Everyone had their different methods. Some people try to, ca try to conquer death. The, the pharaohs of old thought they can conquer death by embalming themselves and, and their live, uh, uh, wives in, in, the, in, the, in the pyramids, in the sphinxes in Egypt. And everyone had their own method. <clears throat> Moses, of course, was listening to God and saying, so what is the answer to this question? Can we, can we or can we not? And that's where the leaving of Egypt is so central. It's really in one word, if you want to completely tr translate in different terms. Don't use the word yet. See, don't leave. Let's not stereotype it and tr get trapped in language. If someone were to say to you, the central theme of all of life is transcendence, that would resonate with us all. The problem is when you hear Yitzhiya Mitzrayim, the Hebrew, the stereotypes, especially if you went to Hebrew school, they become very, very uh, complicated because it doesn't let you really see it tr for what it is. And I have to share with you what I often share, just to talk about language. Early years of this class, I would say 25 years ago, um, when we just began, it wasn't really a class. It was just a, well, I don't even know if it's a class now, but whatever you call it. But we used to stay up till 4 a.m. sometimes. And the core group were people from the arts and entertainment industry. Yeah, if you want to stay up 4 a.m., I'll be, I'll be glad to uh, accommodate. But I know some of you have a curfew. Okay. So um, there was a core group was arts and entertainment people. Mostly Jews, some non-Jews, but it was a very a powerful group. They all had spiritual experiences. As they said, they said, well, it didn't really come from traditional sources. Most of the people would say that they, their experiences came from Zen Buddhism. That was a big one. And, uh, and of course, LSD. You cannot neglect to mention that. So, um, so it was a very interesting interaction between myself, where I came from and where they came from, and we had these conversations about the search, life, the journey of life, and all the challenges. And I remember um, realizing that they were bringing new people all the time, and I realized that just sitting there with a beard and a yarmulke was not exactly neutral, and it would be wise to probably uh, to address that. But I didn't know how to really address it. What am I supposed to tell them? Listen, I think you're all stereotyping me and just by, because of my look. You know. So I tried an experiment. I realized, as I said, that I may be evoking all kinds of images, meaning I may remind one person of an angry grandfather that schlepped into synagogue at Yom Kippur against his will, or an irrelevant Hebrew school teacher, or, uh, or even a warm, nice memory. So I tried this experiment. Instead of using the word God, I never used the word God, I used the word higher reality, or the essence. That was the essence was the good one, the essence. The essence of it all. And then uh, there was a particularly more new age type of group, I would say, like uh, non-existential states of undefined energy or something. <laughs> and instead of Torah, I used the word blueprint. And instead of mitzvahs, I used the word connections. And instead of um, Mashiach, Geula, redemption, I used the word destination. 
you know, the final destination. And they were like listening to this discussion about the journey to the essence of it all, using various connections and following a blueprint and, and reaching the destination. And everybody was like, you know, they were like really into it. They wanted to know where I got this from and so on. After a few weeks, a guy came over to me and said to me, so are you talking about God? Because I never, never used the word. He said, I said, yeah, but shh, don't spoil it for the others. <laughs> you know? And I learned there that experiment, something very, very uh, profound, which I never forgot and I still utilize it, which is that language, even though we're so trained, you know, let's just communicate. You know, you get the silent treatment from someone. You never like that. So you said, let's talk. So we all think that language is about building bridges. We're going to talk and get it out of our systems and we're going to communicate. That's fine and good. But I have to also tell you that language has another side to it, which can also be a trap. Language is about words, and words often evoke uh, reactions in one person that to another person is neutral. I may say a word that means nothing to me, so, and it may cause you to go ballistic, because that's the word your mother used every time she got hysterical or something. In other words, words have a, a potency. The word God is not just a, a word that everyone, oh, it's a nice little word. There are people who hate the concept of God, because they've seen what was done in the name of God in the name of religion. There are people who are um, passionate believers, ready to die and kill others in the name of God. There are people the other way around. There are passionate agnostics and passionate atheists. So everyone has an opinion about God. It's not a small matter. God has serious implications. God, personal God, scientific God. Doesn't mean that I'm responsible if there's a God. So it's not like we're neutral to this. So this three-letter word has more meanings than you'll ever even imagine. I don't think there's any two people that would even translate the word God the same way. I mean, besides the prerequisite uh, first uh, cause or creator or something like that. You know, define it in personal terms, what you think it is or not, and so on. So, and the same thing is with the word Torah and the same thing with the word mitzvah. So this is not a simple uh, ish, ish challenge for me to sit here and talk about these things because all of us have stereotypes, and I include myself as well. So when we talk about these topics, that's why I wanted to just point out about language. Language is critical. So Mitzrayim, I heard it also my whole life. And when I was a teenager, I started wondering also, what is this thing that Jews are doing every year? I used to ask my father this. This was my like fifth question. After he asked the four questions, I used to always ask, so why are we sitting here in the first place, you know? Now, I didn't mean to be uh, disrespectful, but it was really, it, it troubled me. Because I saw a lot of people around me. I grew up in a traditional Jewish world that were just robotic. They did it mechanically. You know, today I can see that there's some beauty to, to good habits, at least the better than nothing maybe, but I also see the, the grave uh, the, the damage done by it. Because if it's only robotic, what does it tell us? There's a bunch of blind uh, fools that are just following a certain guidelines. Okay, so the Catholics do their Catholic things, the Jews do their things, the Muslims do their And that's it. People need, uh, they need uh, someone to tell them what to do. You know, all the stereotypes around religion as a crutch and weakness and then the need to believe in something when you're desperate or whatever it is. You know, I'm pretty familiar with those arguments and actually I can make them quite well because frankly God is not something you could prove or disprove because for every proof that God exists you can bring a proof that God doesn't exist and you can remain on the fence the rest of your life. You have to make a choice about things like this. The choice is based on some logic but also some other things, observation, and above all, experiential. Like if someone says to you, do you think music touches your life? You don't need a mathematical proof that music touches your life. You don't need someone to connect you to sensors and show that your heartbeat goes up when you hear a song. You know it does because it touches you. To me, ultimately, what I came to learn when I started understanding the mystical, the spiritual side of the Torah, that this, I started wondering, how does, how does this book know this? How does it know this about my soul and your soul and so on? And I came to realize that there, is, there are universal truths that are beneath the surface. So when you talk about this word Mitzrayim and Passover, what you really have to say, this is the search for transcendence. And the question that Moses had, and that's what God addresses in this chapter, can you find renewal and transcendence in a dark world? That's what it comes down to. And God said, I put a moon into the heavens to demonstrate that no matter whenever in time you will be, you will always be able to look at it and see that as the point that it's about to go out and it comes completely disappears 
is the point that it is born. Which means never allow yourself to, be, to succumb to just the darkness that you see. Because that would be saying you're worshipping your narrow, uh, uh, short -eyed, short, uh, t short term vision. And that's ultimately self-worship. And worship of your own perspective is your own worst enemy. This is the key to every healing. So when someone comes to me or someone comes to you or someone says, look at my situation. It's terrible. I don't know what to do. It's hopeless. And they're convinced. I'm not even talking about someone who's exaggerating. You know, they, they list it on paper and it seems pretty bad. What is the answer? The answer is we only see a little piece of reality. You don't see the whole picture. This is what objective friends are for, to help us look a little deeper. You may not see it, but never start worshipping your perspective, especially when it's a hopeless one. Because that basically means you write yourself off based on your conclusions. You're so right. People, um, I could, I, I, how many conversations I had like this with people who say to you that things are hopeless. You know, I've been dating for years and years, and everything always ends up in a, a, a failure. And I want to know what curse has been placed upon me. There must be some curse in heaven. And when, of course, you ask the question, did you really try everything? And they say, I tried everything. And who determined that? I did. You know, is it possible that maybe you didn't try something? Is it possible you have a blind spot? That's the good one. Uh, yeah, it's possible, but I know what it is. You ever hear someone who knows what their blind spot is? So that's like the doctor that says, I'll tell you when you need a second opinion. That's the whole point. That I need, and that's what you need a second opinion for, because you can't tell me when I need a second opinion. So a blind spot's a blind spot. Now, humility, you know, or rather arrogance, sometimes takes on a different shape. Some people think of arrogance in terms of people being pompous and, and, and self, uh, self uh, whatever it is. Um, what's the word? Yeah, self-aggrandizement and uh, boasting and, and so on, being aggressive. But you know, there's another form of arrogance that takes on a completely different shape. It's very invisible and very quiet. As a matter of fact, it looks like the exact opposite of arrogance. You know what that is? It's complete lack of self-esteem. When a person is convinced that they're worthless, that's just as arrogant as a person who thinks is, is, is the, God's gift. Why? Because who, who told you you're worthless? Who are you to convince yourself and convince others that you're worthless? God put you on this earth and said you have value. And you're so convinced you're worthless, that's a form of arrogance. It's just a form of arrogance that's like the black hole that is inverted. It inverts into you convincing yourself that you're something that you're not. So arrogance doesn't always have to take on the shape of you being, uh, think you're better than everybody. It could also take on the shape you think you're worse than everybody. Think about that. There was a, uh, a rabbi I know, and he was a young student, so one of the rabbis told him he should go out and teach and speak and explain, to, lecture. And he was very shy. He says, well, I, don't, I can't do it. I, you know, I gave all the excuses of you, humble excuses. And the rabbi said to him, listen, he said in Hebrew, in Yiddish, which is in Hebrew, partially Hebrew, he said, which means misplaced humility is rooted in arrogance. That's what he told him. Humility. Because humility doesn't want to fail. He doesn't want people to laugh at him. Not always humility because he thinks he's, so, he's a nobody and stuff like that. So when you talk about um, rejuvenation and renewal in the, in the times when, or, or when we feel, as uh, King Solomon writes in Kehelet in Ecclesiastes, a generation comes, a generation goes. Der helach v'der ba. A generation comes and a generation goes. Ve'ein kol chadash tachas hashemesh. And there's nothing new under the sun. Yeah, it's a very depressing statement. Basically, the more things change, the more they stay the same. There's no hope. Generations come, people go through their whole same vanity, and they die, and they're born, and they do the same thing again and again and again. Now, this is the ultimate... Uh, th cold water that a person can throw on anyone that has a little passion. You think you're accomplishing something? Yeah, yeah. You know, they, they, the joke they would say in Yiddish is that in Harazesim, which is on the Mount of Olives, there are signs, here lies someone who thought he was indispensable. <laughs> yeah, there were other people who thought they were changing the world. This is a classic uh, Amalek uh, way of speaking. Um, don't, uh, don't think you're so uh, hot. You're so powerful. 
You want to go through your little delusions, fine. You want to convince yourself. And you see Kehelet, it's a holy book. It uses expressions like this. But as those that know how to read the verses, also there's an answer to it. What is, what is King Solomon saying? If you listen closely to the words, he says, a generation comes and a generation goes, and there's nothing new under the sun. Correct, under the sun there's nothing new. But above the sun there's a lot of new things happening. In other words, if you decide or determine at some point of your life that you're going to go through the motions, that through conformity, the motions that most people go through, or as we like to say, the road not less traveled, the road most traveled, you have basically defined your destiny as being one where a generation comes and a generation goes, and not much will change. That's your choice. But you also have a choice to reach a place that's above the sun. What that means is to reach a deeper place in your soul where things are constantly new and have the power to change the world. If you want to know the secret of an Abraham or a Moses or any great man or woman that lived in history that actually changed the world in a real way, you'll see there's only one common denominator they all have. They never were conformists. They never followed the tide. It wasn't about what others say. It was about what their heart and soul said within. And it's a lonely place, you have to remember. It's not just an easy place. You know, a lot of us like to feel we're like um, revolutionaries. We're mavericks or, uh, you know, experimenters. But if you really look at pre most people, you'll see, yeah, they're, they're right behind someone else who's experimenting right before you just in case it doesn't work. The people who really jump first are very rare and very few. And I'm not suggesting we all have to have that inside of us. People are made of different wired different ways, but it's important to access that because all of us have that ability. There's no question about it. So what God is telling Moses when he says to Machedus Shazel he says, you want to understand the secret of getting out of stuck of your inhibitions and fears and insecurities, the Mitzrayim. Whatever that Mitzrayim may be, you want to find this power of transcendence. You have to find the power of renewal that's in your soul. And that little child that I was talking about before that plays around and is constantly moving around never dies. You think you don't have that child inside of you? You do. And there are times when there's trust and an environment where you feel comfortable at home, you'll see that part of you can come out. Sadly, we don't have many spaces like that. Even our own homes have become battlefields, often, which is what makes it so sad. Because what ultimately is a comfortable place? What, what does it mean to be at home? It's not just a, a roof over your head and it's not raining into your uh, bed or uh, a place where you can take off your shoes. Where you can, it means that you're also comfortable your, with your soul, with yourself. You're comfortable with the people that are there. How many people? I've seen many beautiful houses, but beautiful homes, warm homes, it's not such a common thing today. You know, we have developed what we call a career, work. We are all chasing our tails, making ends meet. The economy rattles everybody. To have a place like that requires obviously creating an oasis that requires some access to a place that is not bound by the ups and downs of the marketplace and about the fluctuations and the vicissitudes of uh, daily life. Now everybody here has the ability to access that place. And it doesn't take years to train yourself to get there. Well, the most important thing is two things actually, two most important. One is the absolute confidence that it's there, and two, to do something about it. But what the big challenge is that you are, we are already creatures of habit, and what controls your life is not your soul. What controls your life are your habits. And your habits take over, and they become your patterns, and they become your activities. And you say to yourself, okay, tomorrow I'll make a little space, or next day, or weekends, or the holidays coming, or the vacation, or whatever it is. And what, happen, what continues to happen? The life as you live it continues to play itself out. And the hardening of the shell just continues on and on. Unfortunately, what usually shakes a person up, that so-called, um, uh, what's the word, pulls them out of that orbit, jolts them out of that orbit, is a shocking experience. Trauma or a loss. And we sometimes wonder, is that what we have to wait for? Absolutely not. That works because what it does is it shakes up your whole existing so-called uh, landscape 
and you have no choice, and therefore you, you have to reach to something else. Even this whole economic, uh, whatever they call it, meltdown or global recession, everyone's got their word for it. Um, and some people feel, okay, it's going to go away soon. We're back to, we're back, back to, to where we were two years ago. Until the next uh, in the 30, 40 years from now, our children will have to worry about it. You know. that's, that's the view that many people would like to believe. There's also another viewpoint that this will never, this will, the economy will never be the same, which many of us do not like to think of. And then there are others that just don't know. We don't, don't know. And as every day passes, you see that experts, uh, this word called experts, economists, who is it? I just read that, uh, who is it, the great economist that said that, that economic forecasting has only one value. It makes astrology look good. You know? Sorry? Okay. Whoever it was. So um, it's almost like weather forecasting. But the point being is, what's most depressing for some of us, not to me actually, is that all these so-called experts that were being paid to be experts and the government officials really are as, as clueless as we are. Because when some things get so big, nobody really knows what to do. So, what, 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 so either you put your head in the sand and you just ignore the whole thing and go off to Israel, maybe they say Israel's economy is booming. The, the good old paradox with Israel, there's no leads, the heads of governments there, there's no trust, there's no nothing, but for some reason the Jews have an economic boom going on during this whole thing. We just read an article about it, where was it? One of the magazines. Or you can, uh, what most of us do, are addicted to our televisions and internet, and you'll hear the gloom and doom every night, and uh, and constant predictions, and you get you just nothing. You know, I think if you read the newspapers today, and try this out, and then read it in two weeks from now. Just save today's paper; it'll probably be more or less the same story, just a different company name. You know, AIG. It could be someone else. So, what what is one? How does one look at all of this? And I'm sure I'm not, I'm not, of course it affects people. People have lost jobs. People have lost money. Um, I'm not suggesting that this is just an illusion. It's really affecting many, many things in life. But I could say this, and uh, this is where I come from. To me, what I've been taught, what I've been trained, is that even if this is a complete meltdown, which it may, most likely will be, because it's not affecting one sector, it's affecting too many, and, uh, and the loss of perceived wealth as they say, psychologically, there's more pain in losing a thousand dollars than joy in gaining a thousand. So human beings are of such nature. So this is not such a small matter. I see it, frankly, a real test of our own psyches. That's what it really comes down to. You'll see the men from the boys and the women from the girls, just to not be sexist here. Um, which means, uh, is there a bigger picture? I have no doubt there's a bigger picture. Remember, there was a world before capitalism too. Capitalism is not some holy grail that existed from the beginning of time. And I, you know, as Churchill said, it's the, it's the worst system. He's never found a better one. You know, I would like to believe that this may be a paradigm shift that will cause the economy and, the, and true leaders to emerge that will have to craft a new type of economy where trust is built into it. There's no trust. And I'm just writing, in the middle of writing this week's article. And I find it so ironic on the currency you know, the crisis of trust. You can't trust fund managers. You can't trust uh, the, all these people taking bonuses. You know, can you trust the government is a big question. Can you trust capitalism itself? It's another man-made institution after all. And it's only built on if there's mutual trust. And what is really happening? And then it's interesting, ironically, that on the currency that we have, and every penny and every dollar and every coin, every piece of currency, is etched the words, in God we trust. Who came up with that? You know, I did a little research in Eisenhower's times. They finalized it, but it goes back to the 1800s. It really goes back to the Declaration of Independence. It's very interesting. In God we trust. And you think about it. Is there maybe without that, maybe there cannot be trust. Can you trust me if uh, I'm just a human being and you're a human being? We're all humans. We have greed, selfishness. If there's no God in the picture, will there really be trust? Now, no one really wants to bring that up because then religion gets into the picture and that will just mess everything up. But frankly, as a Jew and as a student of history and the human condition, I have no doubt that that's a major factor. I would not trust somebody unless I knew that it's a, it's a God-fearing person. 
because in their privacy they can get away with it. Why wouldn't they do whatever, whatever, they, whatever they stand to gain? That's what an economy based on greed is all about. Now, if we had an SEC that were God-fearing, it's one thing. But, you know, the regulators that were paid are not being penalized for not doing their job. You know, if you hired a guard to watch your house and your house burned down, that guard is liable. Why are the regulators not liable? So to me, the whole thing is like, a, you know, a major mess. That means, who you, so who exactly are we trusting? You know, I mean, some people I know think that President Obama is Messiah. And I'm not saying he's not trustworthy. His intentions may be good, but you're dealing here with a machine that's a lot larger than just one person. So I say to myself, the Jewish people are here almost 4,000 years. And they've gone through many economic uh, downturns, you can say. And bigger downturns than economics. You know, holocausts. And it goes back to a man called Moses that stood in a dark place called Egypt. And we're here live to tell about it. And God showed him in this lonely night, quiet night, something that could have been never known. That here's a little moon that's about to disappear. And as it's about to disappear, it's reborn. And Moses, the great Moses, took from that energy to be able to tell the people, not just that we will leave this Egypt, that throughout history, no matter when you'll be in a locked or trapped place, never forget to look at that moon. Because it shows you that if you have the vision, you can see it through. So I say to myself, you know, I'm an American born, so on one hand I'm American, but on the other hand, as a Jew, I feel the ancient genes of this power. If you really allow yourself to understand the power, a nation that has survived it all is the best one to speak at times like this when things are dark. Because they could say, we were there, my parents were there, my ancestors were there, we witnessed darkness. Now, frankly, we've got to have to put things in proportion. Is this the darkest of times? Hardly. You know, we're talking about, ultimately, we're talking about money. We're not talking about six million innocent people being killed and the millions of others that are killed throughout history. But even the darkness that some people feel, or the gloom, or where we're going to go from here in security, there's much to be learned from those that came before us. So really, this comes down to a choice. You know, um, I just, someone met with me a few days ago who lost a lot, a lot of money, and he's like, he's always been very upbeat, and he came to me for a so-called injection of, uh, of hope, which I gave him uh, free of charge, uh, I, I, and I don't think it's about being an eternal optimist. I really believe that if you look deeply into history and you look deeply into people who survived the harshest circumstances, you find a, a new reservoir of joy and hope and rejuvenation and refresh, re refreshing new energy that lies dormant inside each of us. I have no doubt about it. I can see it inside every person in this room here. And not because I have necessarily blessed eyes, it's because I can see it in myself. And if you hang around people that have that type of uh, confidence, and really I would say even more than confidence, I would say familiarity with the soul, it will come out of you. I think it has a lot to do where we hang out and what kind of environments we choose for ourselves, which is often a product of our patterns and habits. And you change that a little, Mishana Mokim, Mishana Mazel. You change your environment, and you change your destiny. That's a fact. Because environments affect people like us. We're not, we're not super spiritual creatures. We're people of this world. We're affected by people around us. We're affected by their moods. And remember, we're also our parents' children. So what we grew up in at a home, if our parents were gloomy or they were uh, despondent, it affects us. These things can be changed only if you change your environments. And I think that is the key challenge that we have so Passover is coming. Maybe it's time not to do the Seder way, the way you usually do it, in the same place, in the same environment, because you'll be sitting at an evening that can give you the power of transcendence, but if you do it the same old way, you're being doing it in a, like in a prison. So that's not really going to work. And maybe a simple suggestion is that we should all find something, maybe not every day of the day, week, but find one day of the week or a few times that you can find yourself another environment. Maybe find a few new friends and especially ones that uh, believe in you and believe in possibilities. That is the ultimate uh, challenge. But it comes down to this. Yes, we have inside of us a soul. The soul is a throbbing, vibrant force, more powerful than your heart and more powerful than your mind. The soul is what gives a person the ability to experience magic. Why we don't experience it is not because 
things happen to us in our lives is because, we're, because that soul is trapped inside of a body, just like the Jews were trapped inside of Egypt. We're trapped inside material needs, material desires, distractions. We're seduced by all kinds of trivial and superficial stuff. And you can make, the, you can make your own list. To change all of that cold turkey is not so simple. But to introduce into your life something that has soul, that is in everybody's power. No question about it. I always make the suggestion that even if you're the busiest person in the, in the world, every morning when you wake up, there's no one here that doesn't have the moment, a, a minute or two, to say the moda'ani, that prayer that says, I acknowledge you for returning my soul to me. You talk about renewal, every morning you're renewed. That's a blessing. Be aware of it. Don't just think and take it for granted that the morning came. Okay, you know, everybody's waking up. So first of all, not everybody wakes up. Second of all, even if millions do it, that doesn't mean it isn't a miracle. As I've often shared here, the Baal Shem Tov says the difference between a miracle and a natural occurrence is one thing it's called frequency. If the sun were to rise once in our lifetimes, everybody would come rushing out. Wow, what a beautiful sight. The sun, this ball on the horizon... And we have camera crews, you know, all kinds of stuff. But since it happens every morning, well, I need a new rush of excitement, a new high. Essentially, miracle means, I'm sorry, nature is a bunch of miracles happening in a, in a, in a consecutive pattern. And once it becomes a pattern, you lose sight that it's a miracle. A miracle is seeing the extraordinary within the ordinary and the supernatural within the natural. There are people that are connected to that place. If you're not, find yourself someone that is. And you'll see that they'll teach you how to be. And that can be in every act we do. The most mundane acts, even the most monotonous activities you're involved in tomorrow morning, tonight. If you think and conscientiously put, 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 focus on looking for something extraordinary within it, the divine providence, the opportunity, and not just self-gain, what what's in it for you. Because that's back to the old patterns. What's in it for others? How, what, is it, what, what can you do to serve? So you meet a new person. That's a new opportunity. You wake up a new day. You have a new, a new, a new opportunity. This is about an attitude to looking at everything that comes your way as something that's new. I could tell you for myself and I could tell you for many others who have made that type of leap and commitment, you, you find renewal all the time. And even in challenges, that's the thing. I was just reading an article, fascinating article in yesterday's Times um, science section there about a, a bipolar doctor who took bipolar, her bipolar disease, and you got to read this article, and turned it into an asset, unbelievable. And I think to myself, you know, what is it that she has more strength than others? Was she blessed? Or she had that focus, and she took literally challenges that... Nobody wants to hear about, nobody wants to know about, of, and turned it into some type of asset. Now, this requires strong fortitude, but it also requires people that around you that also have that, added, have that approach. And this is something that's in our power. So as we approach this, this Shabbat, the newness, the renewal that comes with the new moon of another year, we can look around and see many people you look at some Holocaust survivors, you look at others, yeah, there's a lot of pain that they carry and a lot of damage they've done even to their own families. But there's also certain strengths that you can see of people who have survived harsh, harsh circumstances. And it all comes down to an access to another dimension within ourselves that is absolutely reachable and uh, absolutely accessible at any given time. To do it ourselves is not always that easy. As I've said, you need to have others that can help lift you, and you lift them. And uh, the challenge, of course, is for us to want to get to that place and not have to wait till we hit the rock bottom and when things are so bad that they have no choice but to go there because there's nowhere else to go. So with that being said, I would like to conclude on a little, a little blessing, I guess, that God should bless everyone here to um, have the fortitude and the wisdom to access the fountains of uh, renew rejuvenation in your own soul. It's right inside of you. It's not outside. It's not anywhere else. And it doesn't cost any money. And, uh, and others can help you access it or better put to cut away the weeds 
that allow your flowers to emerge, but ultimately it's you that has to be the one that believes in it. And you cannot allow the darkness of, and the voices, the haunting voices of our pasts, including of our families and homes, to allow you to stop yourself from reaching the ultimate potential that you're, each of us is able to reach. So, um, being that we're going now into this month of uh, Nissan, and there's a few more weeks to Passover, so the focus of the next weeks will be, as we have on the website, you can see the calendar, all the subject matter that will be related to the concepts of transcendence, especially in challenging times. But I also want to say this, that if anybody needs um, help in finding a rejuvenating Seder table, you can please speak to me, and I'll be happy to uh, maybe help you find a little new environment. Uh, for those that have never done a Seder, I guess everything is a new environment, but, so, but some environments are better than others, let's put it that way. And I'd be happy to assist you in that fashion. So you can either speak to me or to uh, Golda Malka or Velvel. That Velvel? Raise your hand. That's Velvel, who is uh, at everybody's service here as well. You know, I've, I've been blessed to be around people like Velvel and Golda Malka and a lot of other people that, like yourselves that come here that have uh, making, made the choice in life instead of being takers to be givers. So I want to wish upon all of you to appreciate what that can do for your life. So you think about it. Instead of being a taker, to be a giver. And as I said again, I welcome you all to this class and to next week, Wednesday, I'll be giving another class. Next Tuesday, oh, right. Let's go in order here. So first of all, tomorrow night, Philip will be giving his series of class, his uh, ongoing series tomorrow evening at 7 p.m., right? It's create spiritual creativity. Philip is uh, one of those guys that I had the discussions with when I mentioned about Zen Buddhism and LSD and that whole, you know, he finally discovered that I was talking about God, but it was too late once he did. And, uh, and, and also I will be here Friday night, Shabbat. We'll have a dinner here and a lecture. The synagogue is doing something, so I'll be the, I guess, the guest speaker or whatever you want to call it. And finally, next Tuesday, my brother will continue his series on the comedy and Kabbalah of relationships. It always makes me smile to say that, comedy and Kabbalah. And then again, I will be here Wednesday, and if you want more details, the calendar is constantly updated, so you can know exactly up to date anything going on in this space here. And as I've shared with you, much more is coming. Um, some of you have seen the metamorphosis of the space. You know, I want to really create this maybe a place, like some people told me Purim, which I guess was the ultimate compliment they felt at home. You know, some parties you feel it's a party. Some people you feel it's at home. So we want to create the type of spiritual oasis, but it has to be with your help because um, uh, it has to have people, obviously. So, so <laughs> I was like that. That makes sense, right? So I welcome you, and there will be many good things happening in this space. Praise God. And I want to wish you all a good week. It's always an honor and pleasure to share a few words with you. And hopefully... Um, they are giving you a little power to deal with your upcoming um, challenges. Everyone have a very good night. And uh, if, you don't, if you have not left your email address, please do so. First of all, I send out a weekly email every week. This week I'm going to write about trust and all, some of these matters. And, uh, and also it's a way of staying in touch. So good evening, everyone. And uh, it's been a great pleasure to be here. If you want to know more, by the way, about the Shabbaton, this Shabbos right here, Raquel, is uh, one of the organizers and one of the great pillars of this synagogue here. So please speak to Raquel about the Shabbos. Okay, thank you again, everyone.